Right, I will call to order this meeting of the uh, Nantucket Planning and Economic Development Commission, this open meeting convening on June 26 at 5.01 p.m. by video conference pursuant to chapter two of the acts of 2023. All supporting materials that have been provided for members of the body are available on the town's website unless otherwise indicated. This meeting is being recorded. Please be aware that other people may be able to see you and take care not to share your device's screen. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. Please silence all phones and devices. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comment. Attendees will join in listening mode. They can click the raise hand button to indicate they wish to speak. We are also going to attempt to um, allow video participation. So it, when you are unmuted, if you have a comment, please also indicate whether or not you would want your video um, activated and we will give that a try. We're trying to use the technology to the best capability. Um, for items with public comment, the chair will afford public comment to those members of the public who have, who have joined the meeting via Zoom. Members of the public who wish to speak must state their names and be acknowledged by and speak through the chair. The chair will call on those who have raised their hands in the order that they were called, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> that they were raised. And we are in, uh, in using a three minute limit uh, following the lead of the select board for public comment. Uh, all questions should be directed through the chair. And if you're not able to participate in the remote meeting, you may also submit comments to Megan Trudell and request that they be read into the meeting record. Her email is mtrudel at nantucket-ma.gov. I'm Mary Longacre, Chair of the Nantucket Planning and Economic Development Commission. Permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Seth Engelborn. Here. I do not see Christy Frantella yet today. Uh, Don Holgate. Yes, I'm here. Wendy Hudson? Here. Dave Iverson? Here. Bert Johnson? Here. Matt Lowell? Here. Gary Rector? Here. Joe Topham? Here. And John Trudell sent a message that he may not be able to attend. So that is the membership. Staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Andrew Vorse? Here. Leslie Snell? Here. Megan Trudell? Here. Mike Burns? Here. And Ray Kwame from Mass DOT. Here. Thank you. Uh, we do not have any scheduled speakers for the agenda. So um, turning to the first item on the agenda, uh, approval of the agenda. Do I have a motion to approve the agenda as posted? So moved. Second. Thank you, Nat. Thank you, Joe, for the second. Roll call vote. Seth Engelborg. Aye. Don Holgate. Aye. Wendy Hudson? Aye. Dave Iverson? Aye. Kurt Johnson? Aye. Matt Lowell? Aye. Gary Rector? Aye. Joe Topham? Aye. And Mary Longacre, aye. Thank you. Is there any member of the public present who wishes to offer public comment at this time? Please use the raise hand feature in Zoom to indicate your interest. We do have members of the public in attendance. I am not seeing any raised hands. Megan, am I? Missing anybody? I'm not seeing anyone. Okay, uh, so no public comment at this time. Thank you. Minutes of April 24th. Uh, I did send Megan a couple of typo corrections. Megan, I believe you have those. And uh, were there any comments or questions on the minutes from April 24th? Make a motion to approve. Thank you, Matt. I uh, well, think I heard Bert as a second. <laughs> okay. Um, roll call vote. Seth Engelborg? Aye. John Holgate? Aye. Wendy Hudson? Aye. Dave Iverson? Aye. Bert Johnson? Aye. Matt Lowell? Aye. Barry Rector? Aye. Joe Topham? Aye. And Mary Longacre? Aye. Thank you. Um, our next item at large membership appointment. Uh, we received one application from Wendy Hudson. Wendy, would you like to say anything to the commission? Uh, thank you for considering me to continue uh, in my seat here. It, it's an exciting time, I think. You know, although we're sad to have Andrew go, it's exciting to have Leslie coming on. And um, as we continue all our conversations around our mission and stuff, I love being part of things like that. So, um, so I hope you'll consider keeping me around. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. And any questions for Wendy? 
If not, would anybody like to make a motion to reappoint Wendy Hudson as an at-large member for a three-year term? Bert, I'll make heard, that motion. Uh, Nat heard the motion. Bert, you had your hand raised? I'll second it then. Second it, okay. Um, roll call vote, Seth Engelborg. Aye. John Holgate? Aye. I'm not sure if Wendy votes on her own appointment. Somebody want to, well, Megan says the same. <laughs> okay, Dave Iverson? Aye. Bert Johnson? Aye. Matt Lowell? Aye. Mary Rector? Aye. Joe Topham? Aye. And Mary Longer, uh, Long Acre, aye with many thanks, Wendy. Looking forward to another Thank three years. Thanks. Thanks, Joe. Next item is our transportation program manager update. Mike Burns, go ahead. Everything on here, and uh, Madam Chair, I will share my screen if that's appropriate, and let me know when that becomes active. We can see it. Very good. Uh, she was my script. Uh, thank you. And this item is to request approval of a comment letter uh, from the chair to uh, MassDOT regarding the draft 2023 MassDOT freight plan. Uh, staff has uh, participated in informational meetings in March and coordinated with MassDOT staff on various questions uh, about the freight system designations and performance measures. Uh, the draft is available online for review. Link is provided here on this uh, slide and executive summary is also provided in the meeting material. The intent of this statewide plan and Rasha, please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, the intent of the statewide plan is to develop a roadmap to improve the existing system for the customers. Uh, stakeholders include all modes of freight and goods movement. Strategies improve safety, condition, operations, and system resiliency. This includes electrification of uh, truck stops, use of e-bikes for delivery, and advanced air mobility uh, operations, or this means the use of drones, uh, which is a component uh, of our long-range transportation plan. There are local considerations to uh, address freight movement uh, issues on and off islands. And uh, this map here is not in your meeting material. Uh, it does show, however, the three comments uh, that are in the uh, comment letter uh, related to freight facilities. One, the National Highway Freight Network designation. Uh, these are typically interstate highway segments. State networks can be created uh, that include uh, the national network. And this network can identify emerging freight corridors. Uh, the second comment, uh, the number two there on the map, is a critical urban freight corridor designation. This is recommended to potentially assist with funding needed to better accommodate freight traffic along Milestone Road, as requested and supported by the public at, I believe, the 2019 annual town meeting. And the third item is a major seaport designation that could assist with funding needed uh, with terminal improvements to address conflicts between vehicles, pedestrians, trucks, and barge operations, and addresses what uh, MassDOT calls underutilized seaports. Uh, comments are due uh, Thursday, June 19th, so this is very timely, and uh, staff did share uh, the comments uh, with Cape Cod Commission staff and Steamship Authority officials. Staff is requesting approval of a comment letter uh, with the following that uh, establish a National Highway Freight Network connection to Hyannis. Uh, it is understood that these designations are updated on a five-year cycle, so there will need to be a couple years before that can be revisited. Uh, number two, a selection of uh, miles, a section of Milestone Road between the Rotary and Bunker Road, uh, designate that as a critical urban freight corridor. Um, number three, designate Hyannis and Nantucket as major seaports. Um, again, we've discussed the reasons why. And number four, support the statewide plan's immediate, robust hedging and shaping strategies as described in the attached executive summary. Um, Madam Chair, that would be the requested action of the commission. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um. Madam Chair, can I just ask Mike a question for you? <clears throat> Sorry. Am I muted? No. 
Mary, I think you're being muted. Mary's muted. Oh, okay. Sorry, yes, I, I had myself on mute. I apologize. Um. <laughs> well, just I just wanted to ask Mike a, a, a Not, kind um, of follow up. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, Mike, and, and thank you, Mike, for all this. This is sort of a mm -hmm. kind of a, a little bit of what you were working on prior to you leaving. Um, the the um, the Cape Cod bridges. Did that come up in this process? Do you know? It, uh, so far as the designation of the National Highway Freight Network connection to Hyannis, that was the intent. If there happened to be some funding necessary for the bridge replacements or the ancillary roads improvements that are related to the bridge replacements, uh, if funding was necessary, uh, designation of those as uh, national uh, freight uh, as part of the freight network could justify there's there's funding that's held aside for freight improvements so that was the intent behind that re recommendation and comment yeah I, I thought that and then our improvements to the truck route I know that that's local but that's probably the biggest improvement we've made other than leaving Woods Hole if you really want to be truthful <laughs> I mean it's amazing how different it is now. There is simply no problems with trucks, uh, modulars. So I think that um, I'm hoping that you could, you know, you, I know you've shared this with Bob Davis and, and his people, but for the future of the Nantucket mm -hmm. Terminal, and it's gonna take a long time to get to the next step, but hopefully this, um, you know, this program can help help us with that because it's going to be a long process to rebuild the Nantucket Terminal. It's not 1983. So thank you, Mike, for all your help with this. Thank you for the comments. Thank you, Nat. Any other comments from commissioners? Um, if there are none, Mike, is this a uh, public comment opportunity? as well or, or is it just for the commission uh at your pleasure madam chair i don't believe this was a public comment but you feel free to just at your right, we do have some members with presence so i will offer them the opportunity to comment on this if they desire uh, again use the raise hand feature in zoom please if you have a comment on this uh, freight plan letter and i am not seeing anyone um, so we'll take a motion to approve the draft 2023 Mass DOT Freight Plan, plan and Comment Letter. We'll make a motion to endorse. Second. Thank you, Nat, and thank you, Bert, for seconding. Roll call vote, Seth Engelborn. Aye. Don Holgate. Don Jean is on mute. Don, are you with us? Whoops. All right, we'll pass on uh, Wendy Hudson. Aye. Dave Iverson. Aye. Bert Johnson. Aye. Nat Lowell. Aye. Barry Rector. Aye. Joe Topham. Aye. And Mary Longacre, aye. And thank you, Matt, for, uh, excuse me, Mike, for doing this work. It's really interesting stuff. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, next item on the agenda, I think you have another update for us, Mike. Uh, yes, Madam Chair, this is a continuation of what was discussed last month. Uh, this is to uh, approve uh, this next fiscal year's transportation work program. Uh, staff had received comments uh, only from STOT, and those have been incorporated and included uh, incorporated into the draft document and include a new task uh, 2.4, which is complete street support a new task uh, 3.2, which is specific to the Regional Safety Action Plan updating or the Safe Streets for All grant uh, work that were ongoing. Uh, those were taking, taken out of a task 3.1. Um, and uh, that task has uh, been adjusted and still includes uh, activities for uh, traffic modeling and uh, any vehicle limitation Im implementation tasks. Um, uh, here is a table that was presented last month with the changes I had noted. I'm highlighting here the new test 2.4 for complete street support, um, the adjustments to the uh, long range of strategic planning uh, activities in task 3.1, 
and then the specific uh, task 3.2 for regional safety action plan. Uh, I should note that uh, nothing significant has been added or removed as far as the budget and tasks. Uh, this is primarily uh, reassigning activities to more appropriate tasks. Um, the public review period for this UPWP began Friday, May 26th. Noticing was done through the town's communications uh, office. A recorded presentation and draft document was made available on the town's Zen City public outreach website. Hard copies were made available at the Athenaeum town building and planning office. Uh, staff is requesting that you take action to, one, take any additional public comments that might be um, uh, made at this meeting and then close the public review period and approve the federal fiscal year 2024 unified planning work program. All right, we will take public comments first. Uh, are any members of the public in attendance who wish to offer a comment on the UPWP? Um, again, use the raise hand feature in Zoom, please, to indicate your interest. And I am not seeing any additional comments at this time. So we'll take a motion. Uh, sorry, uh, any questions or comments from commissioners before we motion? If none, then we'll take a motion to approve, uh, to, excuse me, to close the public review period and approve the fiscal year 2024 unified planning work program. So motion to close the hearing. We'll start with that. Second. Thank you, Barry and Nat. Um, so Barry, you're motioning only to close the public review period, not to approve the program. Oh, we'll get there. We'll get there. I'm just being methodical. We can combine them if you'd like. I, I think, uh, Mike, there's no reason not to combine them. I've already asked for commissioner's comments and had none, so. Sure, and Madam Chair, just for clarity, because I neglected to mention this at the end of the presentation, that we did receive one email late, late this afternoon uh, related to uh, uh, surveying uh, the community and improving our outreach to um, minority populations, which though that comment will be included in the final document. Thank you, Mike. Uh, so Barry, for clarity, would you like to restate your motion? Sure, a motion to close the public hearing and accept the UPWP. Thank you. And Nat, you seconded? Second, yep. Thank you. I'll vote, Seth Engelborg? Aye. Don Holgate? And I don't think Don is up there. Aye. Way. Thank you, Don. Uh, Wendy Hudson? Aye. Dave Iverson? Aye. Bert Johnson? Aye. Matt Lowell? Aye. Barry Rector? Aye. Joe Topham? I, did we lose Joe? I think we lost Joe. Uh, and Mary Longacre, aye. Thank you. And Mike, one more from you. Sure. Uh, this will be a little bit longer presentation, but this again is the continuation of the last couple of months of uh, review. And this is the meeting number three for the development of the long range transportation plan. Uh, just to revisit the schedule here, as shown in the project schedule, this meeting is intended to finalize the vision and goals and review planning priorities, uh, initially review of planning priorities. A draft will be available at next month's meeting to authorize it and request for to authorize a public review of that draft before approving the new long range transportation plan at the August 21st meeting. Uh, just a quick agenda. I mentioned this is a little bit longer slide. Uh, here are the uh, categories that we were going to be going over for this. Um, we're going to be reviewing results of the visioning survey, uh, the updated vision statement and goals, and then introduce the uh, priorities and project selection criteria. Uh, please note that there is a second round of surveying that's live right now to get input from the public on planning priorities. Uh, this survey closes uh, July 11th, not July uh, 10th, like it was noted in the other uh, meeting packet material, we extended that one day. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to uh, discuss that a little bit later on in the presentation here. Uh, just to go over the visioning survey results, uh, again, there's a lot of graphs in the meeting material. I don't intend to go over those, but they're there for if you want to address any specific questions related to those graphs. I do intend to have a high level of uh, a summary of who responded and what we think we heard uh, from the public during the visioning outreach. Uh, so who did we hear from? Uh, almost 800 respondents or responses were received. Uh, most answered all questions. Half of the responses were from year-round residents, and there were some category groups that are more representative uh, than the island as a whole. Uh, again, like I mentioned, there are charts included in the meeting material that demonstrate this. 
And I'll uh, simply note that we uh, received responses prim primarily from older, white, higher income homeowner groups um, than was representative uh, in the island as a whole. That said, uh, responses were generally in this, uh, the same amongst all groups. Uh, so what did we hear? Um, most either drive alone or walk frequently. Uh, they like the island's paths, safe, safe travel and proximity to things. Uh, concerns were uh, primarily focused on congestion, number one. Uh, surprisingly, pavement quality was uh, the number two uh, concern, and there were, were concerns with uh, or issues with traveling between uh, the island and the mainland. Uh, respondents uh, liked the NPC's vision statement, uh, shown here in, in orange on the slide. Uh, there were concerns with this, uh, such as the, the meaning of vehicle limitations. What did that mean? Uh, and there was, an, again, a need to address travel between the mainland. Uh, they wanted more investment in roads, paths, and in transit facilities. Again, clarity was needed uh, related to uh, vehicle limitations, and there was a, a, a lot of uh, comments related to better management being needed to uh, address congestion, uh, pavement quality, and uh, parking. Yeah. And I'm happy to um, skip over any of those graphs that are in subsequent slides here and go um, right into the vision statement. Uh, unless there are questions from the commission, I'm happy to answer any of those. That said, I did try to break down a few things uh, and introduce new material there. I'm not talking about it, but I'm happy to answer questions or, and go right to it if there are questions about what's in the meeting material. Any questions from commissioners on the material presented? I'm not seeing any. Okay, uh, so pardon me as I shuffle through the rest of the other uh, slide deck here to get to slide 34. Um, so we'll get to slide 34 here. And uh, uh, based on review of the survey responses and coordination with staff and the chair, um, edits were, are suggested for the vision statement and the goals. Uh, changes are shown here on this slide uh, and uh, reliable, reliable and affordable were added to the safe and accessible, to having a safe and accessible system. Uh, vehicle limitations uh, need some discussion and is a topic for a, this second round of surveying that we're, do, we're doing uh, to get better clarity on what that actually means. Um, the sensi and sensitivity is being expanded beyond the character of the island. And that will be addressed uh, when we go into the planning priorities. And it might be clearer to go ahead and review some of those planning priorities or get into that discussion prior to taking action on this vision and goals, just so there's context uh, with these and some of the questions might be addressed within uh, some of the priorities falling into these goal categories. If, if it's all right, I'm, I'll go ahead and, and start that review here. Um, so I'm gonna continue on to the priorities. Again, uh, this is uh, at the top of this slide is the edited vision statement uh, at the top. The edited goals are along the left-hand side of the slide. Priorities that align with each of these uh, five goals are shown here and I'll review each separately. Again, priorities are subject uh, to this ongoing second survey um, and we'll help you at next month's meeting. Uh, accessibility includes uh, utilizing the town's complete streets policy to safely accommodate all system users and abilities, improve and expand the multimodal uh, network of uh, sidewalks and bike paths, all those facilities, and institute a paid parking system to encourage parking turnover over downtown, uh, with all of these align with the town's strategic plan uh, goals. Uh, sensitivity focuses on environmental impacts, uh, climate change and resiliency improvements. Uh, the airport has also long requested more compatible uses around their property. Uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, were mentioned at the last month's meeting and we do need to track emissions as part of our tip uh, transportation improvement program per mass dot policy so that's included within this goal uh, category um, moving on to affordability uh, this is a concern we heard related to travel between the mainland uh, we can also invest in facilities and operations that reduce reliability on the automobile which can have a positive influence on household budgets free fair transit has been discussed to incentivize use of the international nantucket regional transit authority and improving connections from the uh, free out of town parking lot to downtown uh, should help with uh, costs. Um, I should note that regional economic uh, competitiveness, which is a federal 
planning factor that we need to address. Uh, regional economic competitiveness is also related to this goal and could include a cost of transport of goods. And we kind of mentioned that or alluded to that as far as commenting on the state's freight plan just now. Uh, related to safety, uh, the safety goals are um, <clears throat> will be better refined during the development of the regional safety action plan this next year. Uh, we will discuss incorporating a safe system approach into our planning practices and include better methods of evaluating project safety improvement as part of the TIP development and project prioritization. I'm going to gloss over this a little bit because this is going to be a huge topic of discussion over the next year about what safe system approach actually means. Uh, but there's a graphic here on this slide of it goes over the principles and, um, and goals of that strategy. Uh, related to reliability, uh, this relates to systems, uh, system operations. Um, and this is, again, a federal performance measure for roads and freight movement uh, that we need to include in the plan. Uh, here is a goal. Um, here the goal is expanded to include travel between the mainland. Vehicle limitation strategies are also included here, which we can discuss next month or even at this month. Uh, um, but I'll just note that we do have this second survey that's hopefully getting clarity from the public. But again, we can have a discussion of that. Um, and I, I guess I'll um, stop there, Madam Chair. Uh, going back to the vision and goals, is there um, the, the question of the commission from staff is, is there consensus that this is a good direction and provides a path to addressing transportation needs in the region? And I would ask, uh, I don't know if you can take a motion or just a spirit of the meeting or just some discussion whether this provides a good direction uh, or are we on a good path to addressing transportation needs in the region? We'll use this to help inform um, the finalizing of a draft document. Questions or comments from commissioners on the vision statement? Yeah, Mike. Um, through you, Madam Chair, um, I just have a couple questions in. Well, you want to just talk about the vision statement now, Mary, or not uh, some of the uh, other yes, stuff? Yes, let's talk about the vision statement now, unless your other questions would cause you to um, comment yeah. on it. Well, the, okay, so the vehicle limitation issue, Mike, as I said before with you, our conversations, I, I, I just think that that is going to be... It, that I think that has passed. I think that issue is kind of worn out and, you know, people realize that that's probably one of the most difficult things, if, if not ever going to happen equitably. Um, and I, I just think that that bringing that into this through these surveys, it creates more questions. Um, a lot of the people don't remember that 1998 article in that discussion back then um, that are here today, um, they're struggling just to make ends meet and pay for their, you know, close to million dollar mortgage. I, I just don't see that as being something that would have any real outcome. Um, but I like everything else. I just think that that's a, a little bit of an issue to, to try to re you know sort of repackage that issue from 20 years ago and bring it back today and i also well no that's more of the other stuff the other pieces mary I'll, I'll i'll just stick with that for now thank you matt so we'll go to wendy oh, thank you madam chair yeah i guess i i was sort of focusing on the connection between vehicle limitations and reliability like what that, that didn't quite seem like the category for me, but I think I, I see that as problematic in the ways that Nat does certainly. Um, but I'm wondering if we have tools we can incentivize like smaller cars or electric cars or how we can, you know, steer the, like steer the fleet toward being, you know, kind of what fits better. Um, it, it, you know, I love all these tiny little European work trucks that you see around now. <laughs> you know, if, if the streets had more of those, it would be less, um, you know, uh, crowded, et cetera. It is, I, I guess maybe I just wonder what, what Mike sort of really means by reliability there. Uh, Mike, if, if I can jump in before you do, uh, I think this might've come out of our conversation. And, um, you know, I, I had the same reservations about vehicle limitations uh, because for a different reason. I don't think it's going to accomplish what people want. You know, people say, you know, we, we've got too much traffic, I'm backed up, you know, it takes too long to get somewhere. 
there's too many cars and reducing the number of cars doesn't necessarily fix that because then the people who want to go somewhere just have to you know use the fewer number of cars more often and uh, so we what we were thinking was that what people really want is for the transportation system to be reliable so that when they leave their house they know how long it's going to take to get where they're going to go they're not going to be sitting in a long line of traffic uh, you know they're, they're going to be able to anticipate what their trip is going to be like and make their plans accordingly. And I think that was the translation that we made between vehicle limitations and improved reliability um, was that really what people wanted was just to have to not think about how to accommodate their um, their desires to move around with a system that wasn't working for them. Um, Mike, do you want to jump in? No, you're, you're exactly right, Madam Chair. Uh, reliability is to ensure that the system operates as expected that there's not any type of uh, uh, significant delays uh, and it creates uh, travel times beyond what the system was designed for. Uh, so that's what reliability means. It's, it's, and, and I'm using that word specifically because it's, it's a, one of our federal planning factors. We, we have to use that vocabulary word uh, when describing system operations and doing performance measures. Um, and you're, you're right, Madam Chair, the, I think the intent of the vehicle limitations was to help the system operate like it was designed to by reducing the volume, taking the volume problem out of the equation. Um, and uh, I, I believe what the town does with their strategic plan is uh, take a different approach, prioritize uh, options uh, for folks, create a, a financial disincentive to, to uh, contributing to the problem of parking downtown, and then uh, uh, the town I guess through the planning board or zoning by law, uh, we, we do have a land use policy that does incentivize proximity to things by having development patterns concentrated in the town overlay district. Uh, and the idea there is to, um, you, you're, you're closer to things. So it's, it's more likely that you can walk and bike and take public transportation uh, to get from, uh, to access things that you need. Uh, so I think that's a better approach. And I think what's used in a lot of other communities that try to address congestion you know, use that land use, uh, mobility options, and, you know, incentivize operations with uh, a number of different ways. So um, uh, what was voted uh, the last cycle here with vehicle limitations and was long been discussed here, I think that's just another approach to taking to address the, the congestion problem. Um, if the desire is to take that out, I'm Happy to remove that if there's if it's felt that that's uh, not appropriate anymore. That said, uh, the second round survey does ask the public what they believe vehicle limitations are. Um, I'm not sure if the commissioners have taken that survey at all, but it's meant to have uh, a spectrum of limitations, whether it's a hard cap on vehicles or does that mean something a little bit softer, like uh, maybe uh, parking requirements are a little bit more flexible and not so stringent it's where too much parking is provided. So we're accommodating the vehicle too much. So it's those types of array of options are out there. And we, we can discuss that at the next meeting or we, and we can also remove this language from the vision statement if it just felt to be inappropriate. Thank you, Mike. I wanna go back to Wendy before we go to Seth. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. My one last thing I forgot to mention was I just wondered where um, taxis and ride share fits into this and if it's part of, you know, that we want more of or less because I think the last time we kind of talked about all this, there weren't the degree of options that there are now. And if we could control costs on that, it would be a nice solution for people to move around. So open-ended question, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Wendy. Madam Mike. Chair. Sure, Madam Chair, I can, I can uh, if it's okay, I'll just cycle back to the uh, accessibility uh, portion of it, and that's to improve and expand multimodal networks. That's everything, uh, bike, pedestrian, transit, Things that I can't even think of. I'm not even going to mention. Well, I'm going to mention urban air mobility, <laughs> uh, futuristic ways of getting around it, which is not on anybody's radar just yet, but might be sometime in the future. So, but like Uber, um, that's part of that. Uh, there's some very sci-fi sci kind of mobility options that are, we're told, are right around the corner. Um, uh, Uber helicopters, that kind of a thing. Those drone type of uh, air taxis it's discussed. So we don't really get too specific with uh, it on here. Just, you know, having that as a multimodal network, you know, just don't want to paint ourselves in a corner. So, so nothing's excluded, even though not everything is specifically mentioned. Is that what you're saying, Mike? That's a better way to say it. Yeah, correct. Okay. 
All right, we'll go to Seth. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have a full point, but just quickly, I am a uh, commercially certified uh, remote pilot from the FAA, and I can assure you that urban air mobility is not happening in this uh, planning cycle. I hope it does happen at some point, and it's fine to keep it in, but not within the life of this plan for sure. Um, but getting back to my main point, I think where I see the crux of it is it's not necessarily vehicle limitations, but it's disincentivizing personal vehicle use. And I think some people have said ways to do that already, like, you know, <laughs> requiring paid parking downtown. Um, but there's others like closing specific streets to uh, vehicle use, making some streets pedestrian only. Uh, and then there's a whole there's a whole slew of these things. And then there's a whole slew of things on the incentivization of other modes of transport, such as making buses free, legalizing micro mobility, uh, hopefully getting drone drone transport all around the islands. Uh, but there's a whole lot of disincentivization we need to do and incentivization we need to do if we're ever going to deal with the congestion issue. Thank you. Thank you, Seth. Um, Mike, let me ask you a question to determine whether or not it would be appropriate. If we changed it, instead of saying with vehicle limitations to say with vehicle use limitations, would that um, be you know, moving us in the direction that we want to go? I would say yes. I mean, I would say that even aligns with the town strategic plan. Uh, I think that's explicit. And one of their goals is to uh, uh, more specifically uh, reduce the rate of single occupancy vehicle use, um, not just driving, but just driving alone, you know, do more efficient things like carpooling or um, things like this. Okay. So keep that in the back of your mind. So we'll go to Dave. I just wanted to ask you, Mike, about the paid parking. Sure. Um, is this on here because it's part of the select board strategic plan, or can you help me understand that? Sure. That was uh, the last planning cycle four years ago when this uh, long range transportation plan was uh, updated. Uh, that was an initiative that, that had support from the region. It also had support with the, the local uh, select board. Um, it's, it's a practice that's part of the equation on addressing congestion to, uh, again, as uh, uh, Seth had mentioned, disincentivize certain uses and taking perhaps revenues from that operation to subsidize areas we want to incentivize, such as free transit fares and uh, it better, you know, have a revenue stream for expansion of uh, paths and improving sidewalks, that kind of a thing. And this that's in line with the uh, the states, uh, I think there was a, a municipal modernization law that was approved uh, a number of years ago uh, that created a parking benefit district. And that was the, that in this parking management uh, and paid parking is to take advantage of that state statute. All right. Yeah. I mean, I can't, I can't deny income, but I just, I feel like, uh, you know, you can see it in town enforcement solves the parking issue. Um, so I just don't know how paid parking is going to make it better. Um, I think it's actually going to make it worse and make it just accessible to people who can afford to pay 30 or $40 a day to leave their car there. And, and that's what concerns me. But thank you. Thank you, Dave. Barry? Thank you. Um, I'm going to have to agree with Nat. I mean, Mike, we've, we've been through this before and the whole idea of imposing vehicle limitations just in, in the way it's stated right now. It's highly problematic. I mean, we've we've seen that fall apart because the you know the concept is everyone else gets out of their vehicles except for me, and now we've limited the vehicles. Thank you. Um, it 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 serves to be a bigger problem area. Gets people inflamed in the process. Uh, you start adding disincentives on here, and I you know again it works well for everyone else, but how does that work for me? Is, is where this always seems to boil back down to. Um, you, we've got to do better than vehicle limitations. I'd probably suggest if you do nothing else, highlight that thought and let's come back to it next month when we have the public review. Once the public review is pretty much to cl being closed, 
who knows, someone out there may have the best idea none of us have thought about. And I, I want, wanted to shut it down at the moment. Um, the second point is that we need, I believe as a town, if we really want to be sincere about this, is get away from the carrot and stick approach. Let's stop beating people for having a car. The, the solution here is, and where I think you'd find people saying, okay, I'm good with trying this, is if you can come up with something that, that both in terms of the cost of getting from point A to B and the time it takes to get from point A and B, if you can come relatively close to those two things when a person jumps in their car, you'll probably have a greater buy-in. But if you're going to make it such that, oh, okay, if we're going to rely more heavily on the, the bus system, I know if I want to get to certain areas that are just slightly out of the downtown core, I need to prepare to spend almost about an hour going on a bus that will go in town and then another bus that's going to go out of town to my destination. I just, I don't think people are going to do that realistically. Everyone else should, but, you know. The I where you have improved li reliability, maybe we want to put in improved infrastructure reliability, because there's there's a great key to solving the 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 traffic situations and the congestion that we currently experience. We, we've talked for years about improvements to our infrastructure system here, and for as many times as we've pitched things, they've been shot down um in in smaller forms and that that concludes it and we've recognized that when we look at those things like the for instance the the milestone artery it needs to have improvements done with it so we need to re-engage on those levels what you're seeing right now is people and, and i've watched it with my own two eyes where they're trying to get from point a to point b they recognize the congestion pattern where they're in what do they do they, they get off the main road and start taking the feeder roads. So here we go. They're just trying to get from point A to point B, but in, in essence, it looks like everything else is getting progressively more clogged up. So I think there are, that needs to be that focus in here is improving our infrastructure in the way it is right now. And let's be serious about it. Those changes that we have not implemented are just they become a cold harsh reality and maybe you can get a little worse every year so anyways thank you thank you barry uh, i'm going to jump in with sort of a counterpoint uh, i'm not sure it's a disagreement but um, a different way of looking at it before we go back to seth uh, if we simply improve infrastructure to increase capacity we're not going to solve the problem of congestion because as soon as the infrastructure allows free flow of traffic, more people will be incentivized to go back to those intersections. As, as Barry said, you know, some of them are finding alternate routes or perhaps alternate times or perhaps other measures to avoid the traffic. When they don't have to do that, they will go back to the lazy, easy way of doing things, which is the direct route whenever it's convenient. And the more capacity we build for that, the more we are telling people that that's what we want them to do. So I would not rely solely on infrastructure improvements with the expectation that we're going to solve congestion problems. It has been shown time and time again through studies that that doesn't happen. Um, thank you. Uh, Barry, do you want to respond? Apologies to Seth. I just want to make sure that we continue this. Yeah, that's now. okay. You, you, Madam Chair, you and I are going to agree to disagree uh, fervently here at this point. Um, we have known for years that by failing to do absolutely nothing with our current systems, that this scenario that we, we, we see today was going to be very much alive. I think you need to give those a chance. Um, I, I There are times when I hear that, I, I feel like I'm back to that old phrase, build it, you know, and they will come. They're not going to come for our improved roadways. So I think we need, it's it's one of many tools that need to be in the toolbox there. But I think there has to be an understanding of what is the psychology behind that person behind the wheel and how do we address that psychology with them on a number of different levels. 
I mean, because the other thing, too, is what I've witnessed is when you tie traffic up that badly, the moment that person clears that intersection, their, their foot's going on the floor at this point to make up for the lost time in between. So not only, not only is it a matter of things are moving much more slowly and congested, you're, you're frustrating your drivers and putting them into a situation where they're forsaking safety over time. So I, I like I said, I, I, I don't want to let that off the table that easy. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Seth, thank you for waiting. Please go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair, and no problem at all. I have a relatively um, specific comment, but it's related to when you said vehicle use limitations. Uh, I think that is close to where we're trying to get. Still not sure limitations is the right word, but I think that we need to be more specific than that. In my mind, it's really this personal or single occupancy use that is the biggest problem. Carpooling is great. Uh, businesses need transportation. When I see you know, three or four people in a work truck, rather than all driving their personal vehicles to a site, I think that's great. The problem that I think clogs up so much of Nantucket's roadway is, is every single person driving alone in a car. And so, I, you know, the vehicle limitations is sort of whatever. If, if one, someone wants to have 10 vehicles at their house and park them all, but only ever drive one of them, I don't care. But the problem that is for me is that if there's 10 people staying at the house, they're all going to the same place and they all drive each of those 10 cars. Just we need people to drive together or to take buses or other forms of transit if we're going to solve this problem. So it's really for me disincentivizing individual use. And I hear what Bear is saying about infrastructure. And I think infrastructure is in many ways. I hear his point about the wave bus. Like for me, that's a reality. I would love to take a bus to work every day, but the nearest bus to my office is the nearest bus station to my office is two miles away. So I think we do need to not only like do things like make the bus free, but we need to uh, drastically expand the routes and the times and schedule. And so I mean, when when we do that, we'll get better results. But for me, it's really that personal vehicle use that's the problem. Thank you. Thank you, Seth. Um, Mike, would you clarify for me? So this is the long range transportation plan. It is a 20 year horizon, even though we revisit it every five years. So this vision statement is really for a 20 year period. Is that correct? Uh, correct, Madam Chair. It's a, it, by, by federal statute, it's at least a 20 year planning horizon updated every four years. Every four years. Okay. So that's one thing to keep in mind as we consider the language in this is that the statement is really looking at the, the very big picture, the longer term. And if we get into some of the details, that's where we're talking about the goals and the actions. So we want to avoid crowding too much specific um, language into the vision statement. Yeah. Nat? Yeah. No, I agree with you there, Mary. Um, just like, to kind of like cycle through this conversation, just kind of a simpler way. Um, we have, we built one roundabout 2007. It's 20 years this year that we tried to build one at the high school. 20 years. 2003 was the first try. Um, the, I think, honestly, and Mike, you can chime in as far as the timing of this, because I believe it's going to happen at some point. I just don't know when. When the milestone rotary gets fixed and becomes an actual roundabout instead of a three-way stop and a yield, I think the voters will finally figure it out. Like enough to support strategically placed roundabouts in, the, in a few locations that need it. Um, if you look at the truck route, Back to that, in a for a different reason to mention it, Francis Street and Washington Street. Does anyone drive through there? And like I drive through there every day and kind of like smile. Like I, I, I'm so happy that that is fixed. But does anyone realize what that has done? That hasn't made cars go faster or or clog somewhere else. They just gradually, slowly 
go through, you can see the bikes, you can see the people. There's no visual uh, looking right, left, right, left, and guessing and waving and all the crazy stuff we do at our four-way stops. That works. That works. And anyone that thinks that doesn't work is, I mean, obviously there's just a negative mindset that can't be adjusted. So I just think we need small improvements. I think, um, I think we'll get there eventually, but they may be overpriced by the time we actually say the word yes. That, that to me is the biggest problem. I think Love is Lane getting done is going to change people's minds as well because it's going to spread vehicles out. Once you get to about 9.30 in the morning, 9 o'clock, 9.30, Old South Road is not backed up to Richmond. I mean, it, it works. I drive about 70 miles a day. I go from one end of the island to the other. I'm all over the place, turning around in people's driveways and going the other direction because I just got a call to do something different. And I get to everywhere I have to go. It's harder in the summer. Of course it is. But it's not like you're, you can't go to work or you can't do something. That's not accurate. So that's all I have. I won't belabor this anymore. Thank you, Nat. We'll go to Joe. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I agree with that. I've been little by little sneaking through Love is Lane, and I really feel it's a nice little outlet. Um, the other thing is Mike had a plan about, you know, expanding the, the – uh, the sidewalk and bike lanes uh, along Pleasant Street. And one of the things I got really excited about is he had a roundabout right at the school. So I would love to see that come into place. Um, and I know that some, it may push traffic further along, you know, up at, um, you know, uh, Prospect and Joy Street. But it, at the same time, I think it's gonna get that opened up and get people moving. I think that's really important. We really need to do that. And, you know, I was in Ireland, I don't know, it was eight, nine years ago, and everyone knows how to use a roundabout. And no one freaks out about it. They all do it efficiently, calmly. They even do it backwards from us. Um, but it, they work, and they work really well if everyone knows how to use them properly. And I agree with Nat. Instead of standing there or waiting at a stop sign and waving someone along, um, you know, I've done that, and all of a sudden have someone – you know, speeding out Surfside Road, almost getting T-boned. And it's just really kind of careful. Uh, you know, you have to be really careful as you come out into that intersection. Because um, that's right. The, the moment that someone gets out of a stop, I think Barry said it, the moment someone gets out of a stop sign and begins to start going forward, they hit the gas and they stomp on it and trying to make up for lost time. But if you're sitting there at the school, I've done this uh, last summer, the summer before, you're sitting there for two to three minutes. It really is not that much time that you're there. I mean, Max, I think I did one time, it was one and a half minutes. Um, so it's really not a lot of time. It's just being just being patient and trying to get through this. So I really think that some of this um, improve, improvements are necessary. So thank you. Thank you, Joe. So I wanna keep the conversation focused on the vision at this point. So please no more individual intersections or um, specific projects. Um, so do we have further comments on the vision? Uh, I think there was a suggestion that we wait for the results of the survey, uh, which would give us more information about what the public is thinking about vehicle limitations. Uh, but other than that piece, um, is, is there any more feedback for Mike? Mm -hmm. Barry? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Just very quickly, Mike, are you, watching to to see if there's any other companies that will offer innovative solutions toward what we're doing at here i know when it came for this island to look at things like wind farm wave action electricity we've been able to engage in some very interesting projects and i always thought of nantucket being the incredibly wonderful test bed for doing certain things so i i just if there's a way we could look at that as well too and see if there's something that that is floating out there that we can maybe glom onto that would be like great maybe there's the solution um i know you keep your eyes on a lot of things but i just want to kind of throw that out to you and figure out how how we can incorporate that in as well thank you thank you Barry. I have, I have, madam chair if it's all right i, I 
worked in a, a region not known for its uh, reliable highways and, and, and safe highways. Uh, it's mm-hmm. lead, it led the country in fatalities and at some of the most congested freeways in the entire country. And um, I think we looked at a lot of different things too. I'm not sure, you know, I'm going to say the word gondola that, you know, that was an idea that was legitimately evaluated in that region. Um, there are also transit hubs and mobility centers uh, that, again, it's very much centered around transit operations, and that requires a land use policy of encouraging densities around those nodes to make sure that it operates well. And uh, we already do a lot of those things very well with our town and country uh, pattern of development. I think our transit system probably could look at a, a bit of an evalu- reevaluation. It, I'm hearing a lot of that from you all now. Um, Quite frankly, that's where a lot of the solution is, is just switching modes from driving alone to something else that whether it's carpooling, taking transit, if that's convenient for you, walking, if it's within good distance to you, riding a bike, if you like doing that, or um, you know, we can also access things through the internet and have things delivered. Um, maybe one day with these drone devices, who knows? Um, but that's frankly uh, the array of solutions that you're looking at, that's state of the art right now. Thank you, Mike. So do we have a sense of the meeting that what we have on the screen is um, suitable for a vision statement with the knowledge that we will have more input from the public on the definition of vehicle limitations and we will come back in our July meeting and uh, finalize this? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think so. I think so, we just have to, alter that a little after the next round of um, the survey, um, maybe come up with a slightly different word than limitations, alternatives or some other word that could make it less um, pointed, you know, directed to, to something, you know, misleading. Okay, that, that would be my opinion. Thank you, Nat. Any further comments on the vision or any um, different approaches that we wanna take? And if not, uh, Mike, please continue with your presentation. Thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, be sure to work with you over the next couple of weeks and with other staff to uh, refine that a bit. Um, th- I did mention we're gonna introduce uh, uh, those uh, planning priorities, which I went over. Uh, the other component to that was project selection criteria, just how, how do we prioritize projects? Um, I'm, uh, can, I can I can answer uh, more specific questions related to project selection next month, uh, and uh, you know this table is from 2019, and the criteria aren't intended to change too much of this planning cycle due to time constraints. Uh, and if it's if it's acceptable, uh, this will be a priority over the next year and going forward, which also should be incorporated into the town's capital planning process uh, to align the, those two processes. Um, project scoring is required to be aligned with the vision and the goals to ensure that they're achieved, and uh, we'll, we'll try to do that better going forward. Um, this is a table, again, from 2019, uh, the priority of projects uh, as they were prioritized last planning cycle for our, our roadway network. Intersections, corridors, and future paths are included. Um, I, I do need to revisit this table, but like I said, this scoring criteria is not going to change too much. This planning cycle is just not enough time to do it. Um, the action plan, which is at the very end of the plan, uh, uh, includes anticipated funding uh, that's currently shown here with a, uh, 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 the funding just distributed equally among intersections, corridors, and paths, focusing on accommodating all users uh, per the complete streets policy. Um, this is uh, the new funding uh, um, amounts for these bands of time uh, going out to 2044 uh, that we have uh, from MassDOT is our anticipated funding revenue goes out to 2044. Um, This LRTP uh, does have additional funding in it compared to 2019. Uh, The recommendation that staff is going to provide is to continue to to provide the equal distribution of the funding for intersections, corridors, and paths. Uh, I should note that transit facilities and their operations are not shown here and will be included in the draft. I just don't have those numbers just yet. So um, just to wrap things up, uh, the draft uh, will be presented to you next month, uh, July 17th. Uh, staff will request re- request that the draft be available for public review through August 21st when it needs to be approved. 
There are additional slides related to current conditions uh, at the end of the packet material, the meeting material here uh, that are still in development. Uh, I didn't really intend to review those, although I could answer questions if there are any, Madam Chair. And I would be very, um, well, it would have been better if I would have had a QR code or something here to uh, encourage participation in the prioritization survey that's ongoing. Uh, I can say, uh, please try to visit uh, or use the links in the emails that we've sent to you or go to uh, nantucket-ma.gov slash LRTP for long range transportation plan to participate in that survey. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mike. Um, and I also wanted to say thank you to Raisa for the MassDOT's work uh, commenting on the, the plans that we've been trying to push through very quickly. So thank you for turning those around. Thank you. Um, all right, Mike, that is everything from you, correct? I believe so. All righty. Thank you, Madam Chair. So moving on to the acceptance of the updated NP and EDC bylaws. Um, Andrew, do you want to introduce this? Sure, Madam Chair, thank you. And uh, thank you to the committee, which is made up of um, Mary and Barry and Nat. And to our staff, I know Megan spent a lot of time on this. Um, uh, and I had to retype the whole thing to get the format issues under control. Um, but I, this is um, an important step to update uh, the bylaws, which I think the last one was from 2008, if I'm not mistaken. Um, the bylaws are allowed under our legislation to be consistent with our act. And it's important that they're um, uh, looked at and um, basically updated to match um, our work. So I would ask um, that the commissioners uh, vote to approve this. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Any comments or questions from commissioners on the updated bylaws? Seth? Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the staff and the committee for working on this. So I don't have any issues with the what's actually written in the page in the updated bylaws, but I'm just wondering, you know, given the planning processes that we're undergoing, um, you know, with re reviewing our membership and we're possibly gonna change the makeup to that membership and reviewing the, vis the vision and the mission and some of the goals, um, does it make sense to, you know, accept this bylaw update now and then go back and hopefully very quickly change it and accept a new one again? Or should we just hold off until we, you know, do the updates that we're trying to do and then create an updated bylaws based on um, the change we're making? Um, so I guess I'll ask that through you as the chair to the staff, if I may, and then back to the committee. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So it's a good question. Um, and I'm going to ask Barry, who is the chair of the bylaw committee to respond, Barry, and then we'll go to Joe. Sure. Thank you. It's, it's very interesting you brought that up because we had that similar discussion when we were getting ready to close out on this current iteration of the bylaws. We, we know that we need to get those updated. There's no question about it. And there was a lot of hard work and energy put into it. I would ask the commission humbly to, to accept what we've done at this point. The future is still a little cloudy as to where we're heading, but there's no good reason within another six months to a year's worth of time that we can't revisit the bylaws and make those changes that need to take place. There's no, there's no magic formula as to in terms of when or how often you can do that. Um, I don't think there was anything in there which was incompatible with where we are at this current moment. Um, you know, but there are certainly it, it didn't fail any of the committee members at all that there are certain things like the composition are going to change no matter what takes place in the course of probably the next year or two. Um, so I think we accept the work that's there. If there's if there's nothing that that seems crazy or egregious with an understanding of that within the near future, we'll go back and address it again. 
but let's let's get ourselves synced together now. Um, it's I, I I hate thinking that it's been that long since we did it, but um, I, I'd encourage us to move ahead. And the, I think the committee members felt the same way as did staff at that at that meeting. So thank you. Thank you, Barry. Let's go to Joe and then to Andrew. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Seth, I understand what you're saying, but I think we've been accused of not doing homework and we finally have done our homework. So I think get it out there. And if if there is a change, then we make that change at that moment or time. But I think for right now, I think the work has been done. Um, and I really feel like we should kind of go forward. I, you know, we had a loss of a family member, if you will, by, um, you know, losing one of our members on the planning board. And then sadly, someone left. So I think that there's been a little bit of hiccup in as far as the timing and trying to keep moving forward. And I think that we've finally uh, moved forward. So I think at this moment, we should, you know, approve this. So thank you. Thank you, Joe. Andrew? Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I would just remind the commission that this process did start some time ago. Um, both Jack Gardner and um, Judith Wegner were members of this committee. And unfortunately, um, they passed away um, before this could be completed. Um, I do think it's important to be updated uh, now. Um, and I think all of your sort of expectations about, I'm gonna use quickly, um, there is a long process to changing legislation that that is before you all. And there are some sections coming up that we haven't even talked about yet. So I would encourage you to, um, move ahead with the bylaws now, and then not be afraid to change it in the future to be consistent with what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. I will add from my perspective as a member of the bylaw committee to not adopt these now would mean that we don't have the benefit of all the work that has been done. And, and I don't see any reason to withhold that. Um, the, the bylaws as they exist uh, were really out of date. Um, and I, I appreciate all the work that was done to get them up to date to where we are now. And I think that we should adopt them. And yes, I think we will have to change them in the not too distant future, but you know, that's the, the breaks life hands you. Any other comments on the bylaw update? If there are none, we'll take a motion to approve the updated bylaws. Bert, I take that as a motion, you're on mute. I'll second. Joe, thank you for the second. Roll call vote, Seth Engelborn. Aye. Don Holgate. Aye. Wendy Hudson. Aye. Dave Iverson. Aye. Bert Johnson. Aye. Nat Lowell. Aye. Mary Rector. Aye. Joe Topham. Aye. And Mary Longacre, aye. Thank you, and thank you, Megan, for a ton of work that you did. Very mm -hmm. much appreciated. Uh, next item on the agenda is the open space and recreation plan update. Uh, Andrew, I think that's you again. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. And hopefully this is the last time we have to talk about this uh, matter. Um, and again, Megan, thank you for um, going through. We did a whole series of additions and corrections to this. Um, we finally corralled some people for their um, uh, some inputs to update some of the factual uh, parts of it. Um, and we did incorporate the feedback, the public feedback that was uh, very constructive about the indoor recreation. So that has all been incorporated into this final. Uh, it is on the agenda for the selectmen on Wednesday. Anyone that would like to lend their voice to have this uh, adopted by them, I would appreciate it. And the commission uh, has already taken a motion to um, request that this be approved. Hopefully we will have that done and then um, that will um, close the chapter on this and uh, open up funding uh, opportunities for the town moving forward. So thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Any questions or comments from commissioners? Okay, so we, we are not doing a motion, as Andrew said, we had already uh, approved the adoption of this. So um, moving on to the next item on the agenda, the ongoing discussion of our enabling legislation. We wanted to look at section three regarding finance and section four regarding rules and procedures um, and to have Andrew speak to us on those topics. Um, so Andrew, back to you. Thank you, Madam Chair. And unfortunately, I mean, this is a, something that 
um, the chair asked me, would I be able to rewrite this before I left, which is actually on Friday, and that is not going to happen, but um, not because I don't want to do that, but because this actually requires some thought and some policy discussion by you all. Um, so I just, just to touch on this briefly, uh, Section 3 of the Enabling Act is about um, meeting expenses. Me, uh, Megan, can you, do you have that available to show on the screen? Sorry, Andrew, uh, go That's ahead. I think you can go ahead, Andrew, while Megan is working on okay. it. So basically, I mean, the, the main issue with this is that um, there's, there's a couple issues. The existing language talks about a procedure, financial procedure on how our bills are paid and, um, and budgeting that is basically not current with how bills and, and everything is paid. It talks about... Um, you know, a warrant approved by the commission or a committee appointed by the by such purpose. And during my entire time here, that's been an administrative matter handled by the director, not involving the full commission. Um, again, that direction has come from the town on and, and many of the other uh, boards on how their uh, bills are paid. The other part of this that deserves some thought by you all is um, the method of, you know, where does the money come from? There's been discussions about, well, it's a town appropriation, so therefore it's like a town entity. And that's really not accurate. Um, but there are other methods to sort of uh, set aside funding for regional planning agencies. In places where there are multiple towns, there are assessments that are basically worked by, by formula. So example, the Cape Cod Commission has a formula and the towns are basically assessed an amount and they pay that amount. Um, the regional planning agency has an amount that's deducted um, by the state um, and that's from the town annual budget and then that's redistributed uh, to the RTA for its operations. Um, so there's different methods, and I think these are the type of discussions that you all need to have with the Board of Selectmen in your future. We, we had an initial discussion on all of these uh, matters before them already, and I think um, September, is that right? Is Leslie there? Thank you. Um, oh, thank you. So the existing language is, um, is in, in the uh, hand side, and my comments are outlined in red on this. And that is that is section three, but I think that needs to be a topic uh, for your September discussions that deserve some thought, um, and it's something I can certainly assist with in reviewing what is done in some of the other areas. Um, section four is a fairly simplistic section. Again, this is um, included in the original act and it talks about, this is where the regulations and the um, uh, adopting the um, just adopted uh, our bylaws where it has to be consistent with our act. Um, this language, probably needs some expansion. Um, and again, both of these sections really need to follow what you all decide the makeup and the mission should be. So hopefully that's what gets worked out over the summer, but these topics, I guess, you know, need to be, we can't, in my opinion anyway, Amending the legislation and not dealing with these sections as well is a mistake. These have to be updated as well um, with both the, um, the overall mission and the, um, the breakdown of the membership. So it's here really just to get you to start thinking about that. Um, and, um, you know, 
that's going to be some summer reading and, and uh, research, I guess. So, so what, one of the things to remember is that I don't think these two sections have been changed since 50 years ago. And so these were written before the NP and EDC existed. And um, so, for instance, the rules and procedures, you know, they had to instruct us to create rules and procedures as we became a commission. But now that we are a commission and we have rules and procedures in the bylaws, this language is a little odd. Um, I also just noticed it has a typo at the end, members shall serve without composition. I think that's supposed to be compensation. Uh, so that might be a significant edit as well. Uh, <laughs> first time in 50 years, perhaps, that anybody read that. <laughs> um, so, so that's the, as Andrew said, that's the, the purpose here is to put these in front of you to get you to think about them. Um, and to be prepared to change these and bring these up to our current situation when we do the rest of the legislation. Yeah. Comments or questions from commissioners? Can I just ask a quick question to Andrew, Mary? Yeah, go ahead, Matt. Um, Andrew, the way you do the budget for plus versus like the, the funding that the planning commission gets for certain activities, I mean, it is extremely complicated and it's certainly not at all like that. Reading that is like the fifties, let alone the seventies, um, pencil and paper, and a phone with a cord that wraps around your feet. Um, so that's gotta be gone through, I would assume by more than just you and Leslie or, whatever it has to be a little bit you know i don't know if brian turbot has to be involved in that or something but it has to definitely be looked at professionally and the, obviously the proper language to how, how both entities work in independent of each other um i mean just reading that real quick it's like wow that's that's old so I'm surprised that didn't come up before in other bylaw committee meetings in the past. You know, there has to be a reason because it was already changing on its own without having to have it. I'm assuming that that's why. I think that, you know, things have just been rolling along and without, you know, without sort of, I guess, an examination of every single word. That is an unfortunate trend um that seems to be affecting aspects of town government so i mean it sort of forced us to look at that more closely and realize that what you're saying that that hasn't been really updated in years um, um it doesn't mean that things are are, ne are necessarily wrong um no. where they are right now but yeah. some of that funding i guess it's important to remember some of the funding you know, and, and another another aspect that we talked about that, you know, that I've at least thought about too is, um, does the commission, you know, should the commission be housed in the county, for example, like the Cape Cod Commission? And again, that, that raises certain budget issues that might, you know, again, where does the division line come in? And this has come up at least when Patrick was here and, you know, we're lucky to have Mike back here who already sort of went through this process, but when Patrick was here, he had a hard time sort of figuring out where the town ended and where the commission began and, you know, trying to explain this to federal, you know, like, you know, when, so when the commission was applying for a grant, it was like, well, what's the commission's separate account number? And it's like, no, it's... Yeah. It, it's an account number used by the town, not not separated. So there's there's some things that that again don't necessarily have to change, but may have to be addressed in or should be addressed at least in my opinion. If you're going through the trouble of updating the um, our enabling legislation, uh, there needs to be some more, I think, explanation or language that covers um you know what's happening so yeah it's sort of like it, if somebody came in and that wasn't familiar with it like like you just said like uh 
Patrick. Patrick's used to uh, a whole different type of makeup. And like the vineyard has, you know, six of everything, I like to say. We have one. Well, we have one that's two in, in, in the sense of the select board and the county commissioner. So we don't have any of these things. But I think the best way to say it is what you said about reflecting what we do now in a general way. It doesn't have to be every word, but definitely covering how we do things today so that it, it, it's like, it's sort of like the steamships tariffs. When they look at that sometimes, oh my God, this thing's in there that are out, as Mary says, outdated in a lot of ways that get cleaned up. Um, I mean, it's embarrassing sometimes to read some of those things that are still there, but I see this as something similar that just it's everything is working fine. It just needs to be sort of clarified, updated. That's all. Madam Chair, can I add, can I add one more point? Yes, please, Andrew. I think, and it's especially true to when, you know, when I've heard about, you know, different, you know, accomplishments or other things that, you know, we are expected to do, you know, the outside of the commission, right? So, I mean, Mike tells me quite a bit about his communication staff that he would go to, you know, when he worked in Houston to deal with some of, you know, for example, when people say, well, we don't have a lot of, um, what? A lot of, um, I guess, you know, uh, support on some of the surveys, right? And so there's a whole separate department that works on, you know, doing outreach and going to different places. And I think as Leslie knows, and as Leslie um, will find out certainly in July, there is there is a very limited staff here expected to do an awful lot. And, you know, a, a good recent example is losing the minute taker for the HTC. That was a separate job. And that was a specific task that one person did. That, that person retired. And where do you think all those duties, where, what, where do you think they all went? To our existing staff that's already, you know, taxed with all kinds of things. And again, there's sort of, it, it just happens. There's not even a discussion about it, but there's also an expectation that there won't be any change in service, that it will all still be delivered at the same time you know, rate and everything else. And, you know, for some, I think if the expectations are for us to expand and do other things, there has got to be a corresponding expansion of uh, either staff or resources uh, that follow that and not just do more with less, which is kind of where we've been for a while. And I think that's been okay. But um, I think moving forward, you all are going to have to think about, you know, again, building a new staff and build, making sure that the resources are there. So. Thank you, Andrew. Further comments from commissioners on section three or four of the enabling legislation. Barry? Thanks. No, Andrew's right, because the other thing that I think may have push this into the background too, was the MOA that was set up with the town when PLUS was formulated out of that. And, you know, again, I'm trying to think even, even a little bit back from that, when we were looking at our bylaws, there, were, there was a strong will to try to partner with the town in terms of, in terms of a, a good working cooperative relationship. Um, you know, the, the, the thing is that the talents of the the planning commission itself translated very nicely into what needed to take place for things like the HDC planning department for the town. They didn't need two separate administrators to do to do that job. But again, those things, as much as they worked well for us and tried to foster a spirit of cooperation based upon how we were doing past past, past practices was great and fine, but I do think it's high time for us to begin to revisit this um, because there are complexities that do lock into our finances as well too. 
um, you know, such as as the the uh, MOA that that sits between the town and the plus department, and how that all begins to interact as well too. So those are things that you, you I'm bringing it up too because as we enter into that dialogue, there's a few more complexities that that need to be brought up and talked about that we may just. I think we take it for granted at times, as as we did with some of the legislation. Um, so we need to be diligent about how we sort that out and realize what all those different uh, ideals and methodologies are that make the whole system work. Um, and then it may be a matter of two trying to figure out what else do we need from the town to make those resources happen as well. For example, the communications department, which was virtually unheard of, I think, you know, Mike would say it's not perfect, but it's certainly, you know, just talking with them a little bit about the surveys and stuff, that have been helpful. So we're going to have to examine, I think, on a much different scale and uh, be a little bit more cognizant of not only what's now in existence, but what else do we need to look at as well too? Thanks. Thank you, Barry. Any other comments? Okay, well, we will move on to uh, other committee updates and reports. Do we have any members of other committees that want to uh, provide a report on that committee's activity? Or anything coming from the planning department? Okay. Um, other business, so we do have a note here to, um, it, as was uh, reflected in the bylaws that we just adopted, the annual meeting is in July for selection of officer positions and appointments to other committees. Um, commissioners are reminded to submit their interest in serving as chair or vice chair um, in writing by email to Leslie Snell. And um, Leslie will be the director of planning at our next meeting, Monday, July 17th at 5 p.m also on Zoom. And uh, we are sorry to lose Andrew, <laughs> but there may be a few people here who want to say something about that. Yep. Matt? Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously I want to say something about that. Um, you know, it could talk forever about what Andrew's done. And I think that so much of what Andrew has accomplished is more about the incubator. I kind of, that's one of the words I use to explain Andrew as an incubator. He sort of has these little ideas that pop out and become something without really anyone knowing where it was incubated. Like affordable housing trust, mm -hmm. the, the, the housing planner position. Um, I like to always say that the one big beach term would just be a title of a song with no lyrics without Andrew. Because how he was able to somehow, and I don't even know if it was totally planned, but to get property owners, a multi-million dollar property owners to give up their beachfront privacy to get these insane 40 foot roads out of their backyard or front yard, depending upon what you call front in some of these houses. I mean, it's amazing. Tristram's Avenue, which nobody knows. If you did a survey, Mike, of that, there'd be uh, 15 people responding knowing what that was maybe not even 15, how that gigantic road in front of all those huge houses was magically extinguished, but there's public access and beach stairs built by millionaires. Um, it's fun to talk about that with people like Al and Reinhardt that know these things, but it is something that you, you know, you just don't, these conversations just don't pop up out of nowhere. Um, but Nantucket, as most people know, 
never recorded things. Things just got left and, oh, that it doesn't matter. It, this property is only worth, you know, $100, $100, you know, which is true at the time or less. And so no one cared until recent years. And the amount of leverage that those paper streets have had and the amount of benefit to public access, property owners, uh, has been, is amazing. Um, the cultural district, Main Street being a registered historic street, Andrew was part of that, but you know, these things are kind of, they drift away and people forget. Um, so I'll close with this. My, the rest of my life, I am going to continue to remind people of, of Andrew, of what he's done, because it's not shiny and sparkling. It's sort of just things that no one really pays much attention to until it comes up. So thank you, Andrew, for everything. Thank you for making me a better person. Uh, thank you for getting me to change my mind. Thank you for yelling at me about Washington Street about eight years ago, seven years ago. Um, Andrew gets a little testy with me sometimes when I go back too far into the old way of thinking and he has to remind me of the way things used to be before I realized. So he's the one that told me why the Kennedy bill happened. I didn't even know when my father went up there and complained about it from Boston. So I didn't even know why it happened. And Andrew had to tell me, the guy from Arlington. So thank you, Andrew, for everything. And I look forward to the next chapter. Thank you, Nat. It's been a pleasure. It's amazing. Anyone else? Bert? Is that song, See You in September? <laughs> Have a nice summer, Andrew. Thank you. Great. Uh, I'm sorry, Dave, go ahead. You're on don't mute. For, don't forget to leave your phone on, Andrew. Not that I don't trust Leslie, but <laughs> we, we, we'll, we'll need to uh, need to know where the bodies are buried at some point. Yep. Same we'll number. You. Same number. We'll, and always we'll miss you, time. buddy. We'll miss you. So you're going to a lot of side bag for the uh, your beach chair. Stick your phone. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. Yes. Cheers. Thank you all for that and for the special bar machine, too. That's going to come in handy, I'm sure. So appreciate okay. that. When's, when's the testing of that again? <laughs> um, it looks a little complicated, I have to tell you. So that's going to be my new project for July. Get that set up. We but can after that, we can, come in, back and he, help, we can come and help you set it up, Andrew. Yes. And, uh, North Carolina is not that far away either. So make sure my address will be here for anyone traveling south. So, <laughs> Leslie? I, I just want to thank Andrew for being an excellent mentor. And uh, wish you the best. <laughs> Thank you all. Megan, I think you have something. I just want to echo um, what Leslie said about being such a great mentor, um, just giving me guidance and advice over the years. And I don't think I would have taken this career path if it wasn't for you. Um, so I thank you for that. Megan, I hope you feel that way after the next couple of years. But yes, you, I, I have full faith in you, um, and you've done great. So, well, thank you all, and I'm I'm not going to say goodbye because it's really just we'll see you in a different role. And as Bert says, in September, September 11th, I'll be uh, hopefully doing some office hours. <laughs> Uh, we can uh, we can reconnect then.
Well, as, as Steve Jobs was famous for saying, I think there's one more thing. I'm not sure exactly <laughs> who's taking the lead on this. That's good. Thank you, Mike. Um, Madam Chair, if I could ask, I'm actually going to walk into the other room. If you could uh, maybe have Megan put, put up the uh, document and if you could read and ask for a motion from the commission, that would be appreciated. <laughs> My, wow. I don't have a copy of the final document. To read it, Madam Chair, I call it a staff recommendation that you get endorsed by the commission. Uh, please go ahead, Mike. You got to get closer to Andrew's microphone. Can, can you hear me? <laughs> can, you, can you hear me from uh, his microphone? Yeah, I have it on my own screen. Do you want me to read it? Yes. Okay. All right. So a resolution to honor Andrew Vorse for his service to Nantucket. Whereas Andrew Vorse retired on June 30th, 2023, after completing 30 years of outstanding service as senior planner from 1993 to 2005 and director of planning from 2005 to 2023 for the town, county, and region of Nantucket. And whereas Andrew Vorse enhanced the relationship among departments of the town of Nantucket and with other state and local agencies and leaders in Massachusetts earning the state's Professional Planner of the Year by the American Planning Association, Massachusetts chapter. And whereas Andrew Vorse navigated wide ranging mandates and changing policy perspectives from the town of Nantucket and the electorate, providing the leadership, compassion and mentorship as director of planning during one of the greatest periods of economic prosperity in island history. And whereas Andrew Vorse brought considerable pressure professional ability and skill to the island to include town of Nantucket employees in the Laborers International Union of North America, create the Nantucket Regional Transit Authority, restructure the zoning and land use regulations in the code of Nantucket, expand the system of bicycle and pedestrian paths, implement the Nantucket yard sale program, and reorganize the planning office, historic district commission and building department into the planning and land use services department. And whereas Andrew Vorse will be missed by his colleagues in Nantucket town government, particularly the staff of PLUS and members of the Nantucket Planning and Economic Development Commission. Now therefore be resolved by the Nantucket Planning and Economic Development Commission that Andrew Vorse be commended for his significant contributions to the efforts on behalf of Nantucket Island and its residents to navigate numerous planning challenges and that Andrew Vorse be extended the very best wishes as he enters his retirement as a resident of both Nantucket, Massachusetts and Edenton, North Carolina, unanimously voted this 26th day of June, 2023. Do we have a motion? So moved. <laughs> I'll take uh, Bert as a second to Barry's motion. And uh, roll call vote, Seth Engelborn. Aye. John Holgate. Aye. Wendy Hudson. Aye. Dave Iverson. Big aye. Bert Johnson. Aye. Nat Lowell. Aye. Gary Rector. Absolutely aye. Joe Topham. Aye. And Mayor Longacre, I, and I will be happy to sign. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, well said. Mayor. Thank you. Really well said. Yeah. I see your authorship in this, I can tell you that. So. <laughs> well yep. said. All right, I think that is the end of our agenda. Is there anything else under other business, Barry? Yeah, Madam Chair, I there, there's two other points of recognition I'd like to bring up. Um, one of which most of us are aware of because we were we were at a uh, function for Andrew, but this is a different forum, and I think this needs to be acknowledged as well too, if you don't mind. Um, screen share is open, is it at this point, Megan? Thank you. Let me get that because this is most impressive as well. There we go. So Commonwealth of Massachusetts, ye it hereby known to all that the Massachusetts House of Representatives offers its sincerest congratulations to Mr. Andrew Vorse in recognition of your outstanding 30-year planning career and well-deserved retirement. 
The entire membership extends its very best wishes and expresses the hope for future good, fortune, and continued success in all endeavors. They get a little proactive here. Given this 30th day of June, when you do officially start retiring, June 2023, at the State House, Boston, Massachusetts, by Ronald Mariano, Speaker of the House, and Dylan Fernandez, the State Representative. Most impressive, and I think that needs to be a part of our records as well, too. Thank you. And then I'll have one last thing. Thank you, Barry. Go ahead. Um, so another thing that happened too that I've been trying to wrangle down without a heck of a lot of success, but that's okay. We're still live at this point. Leslie, are you still there? I know you were. I am. I'm here. Yeah. Um, something significant happened with Leslie taking on her new job as well. She got a very nice letter. Would you care just to chime in about that a little bit i i Please. didn't realize you were bringing that up tonight or what well i could think or... you know what we're, we're we're here also acknowledging some of, of the very positive accomplishments that that have taken place through this commission and i think this is this has already happened it's about to happen now it's the appropriate form don't there's no sense letting time slip away here leslie so um if you, I'm sorry if I've stolen your thunder, but if you would nope. please. I, I had just mentioned to Barry that it was very nice that I received a letter um, from Dylan as well. I'm um, congratulating me on my appointment to the director of planning. Um, he and I have you know worked together over the years. And so it was really nice for him to personally reach out to me on that. I don't have a copy of the letter handy, but I can certainly scan it and send it around. That would that would be appreciated, I think. Um, so through you, Madam Chair, thank you for the opportunity to do these things. Um, I honestly believe this commission works very hard at what it does, and sometimes, you know, in that hard work, there's there's fire, but there's also a matter of too that there are significant accomplishments that that are done, and they're not just recognized here locally, but they're recognized on a very different level as well too. And we need to celebrate those things as well with the work this commission does. So thank you. Thank you, Barry, and congratulations, Leslie. Yes, you're here. Congratulations. Congrats. All right, does anyone else have something up their sleeve that they want to pull out at the last minute? All right, if, if we are truly uh, adjourned, we will take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Thank you, Bert. Second. Second. Uh, roll call vote, Seth Engelberg. Aye. John Holgate. Aye. Wendy Hudson. Aye. Dave Iverson. Aye. Kurt Johnson. Aye. Matt Lowell. Aye. Mary Rector. Aye. Uh, Joe Topham, you're going to have to speak for a minute to make sure we get that on the screen. <laughs> I'll never be able to do this stuff. <laughs> Dave's a great point. First year on resident. I will happily make you a special background that. <laughs> I'll volunteer too. All right, Joe, we're waiting for your eye. Uh, well, I, <laughs> I was waiting for Nat to finish. So yeah. happy trails. Thank you. Thank you all. And Mary Longacre, I am good night. Good night. Good night.